We've been in this series of messages uh, from the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and I've confessed to you that um, I don't think I've ever preached through the minor prophets because they can get a little straightforward, right? <laughs> so, uh, when we set this up a long time ago, uh, I was assigned to preach from Zechariah, the prophet, on Mother's Day. So I opened it up this week and uh, war and stress and tribulation and woe to you who have given birth and your children and uh, you know and I'm going oh my goodness I can't do this I, I just can't do it and all week long I was just agonizing over it and uh, so yesterday I was in here uh, going there's got to be a verse that blesses moms you know <laughs> somewhere else in the Bible and uh, Jana came in and asked me why I was looking so terrible, and uh, which is a weird way to greet the boss. And uh, and and then and and then I said, you know, I just can't do this. I cannot preach from Zechariah uh, on Mother's Day. What was I thinking? And she said, Well, if I recall, you said you wanted to do this because it talked about being prisoners of hope. <laughs> prisoners of hope. Yes. If ever there was a definition of a mother, it was a prisoner of hope. So thank you, Jana, for saving us today. Whoa. So, if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn to it. Uh, I doubt you'll find it by the time I'm done reading. But um, Zechariah, chapter 9, in the midst of all the wars and tribulation and problems and everything. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I'll take away the chariots and the war horses, and the battle bow will be broken. He'll proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now, I announce I'll restore twice as much to you. So let's pray. Lord, I was, had a hard time finding, finding the message today, but um, thank you that you do call us back to you and you do restore us, and you do bring us up out of the pits, and you do reward the prisoners of hope. So teach us from your word today. Give us courage as we seek you, and uh, stay very close. That's our need, and that's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a fabulous passage to preach on Mother's Day. I just want you to know that. This one preaches itself, so I'll just close in prayer. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Zechariah, I'm not going to go into the whole thing. That'll happen Tuesday night when Jeremy's leading the Bible study on <laughs> Zechariah. So he can go into all the depths of it. But I, I just want to point out a couple of things as we ramp into that. The very beginning of the book, as the prophecy begins, and it, and it takes place in um, uh, what is now Iran, uh, and uh, King Darius I uh, was the king, and... Um, People of uh, Israel have been restored to their, many of them have been restored to their homeland, not all, and uh, life is beginning to take shape, but there is battles and wars and all these things. And uh, so verse 2 of chapter 1, the Lord is very angry uh, with your ancestors, therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord declares, return to me, return to me, not just to your homeland, return to me, declares the Lord, and I will return to you. Do not be like your parents, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me. Where are they now? And for that matter, where are the prophets? They're dead too. That's kind of a weird way to start this. But it's God inviting the people not just to come back to their homeland, not just to get their, their lives back, but to come back to their relationship with him. And, and he makes the promise, if you return to me, I'll return to you. We, we, will, we will have this covenant relationship uh, if you would um, come back to me. 
Then, skipping ahead to chapter 7, um, the, the people are trying to do these religious things and they've been practicing kind of uh, religious ceremonial things. And it's a really cool passage here, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, the word of the Lord uh, came to me and said, Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month for the past 70 years, okay, so when you've been doing all of that, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? And then uh, verse 8. This is what the Lord says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless or the alien stranger or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs. They stopped up their ears. That could be painful. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law and to the words of the Lord that he had sent through his spirit through the prophets. So even when God tells us, this is what I want for you, this is how I want you to live, this is the sacrifice I want you to make, not some re religious ritual thing, I want you to, to treat each other with compassion, to live out justice, and, and to welcome the strangers among you. That's what I want. And we hear that in all the prophets, right? That's kind of a common theme that we've thrown. But then we come to this uh, fabulous chapter 9. And uh, it begins with kind of a denunciation of all these warring uh, neighbors. And then this passage that is uh, probably one of the most recognized and the most uh, familiar of all the prophecies about the coming Messiah. This is the one that we uh, read every Palm Sunday, right? That uh, here comes the king. <coughs> Shout, daughters of Jerusalem, the king comes to you, righteous and uh, having salvation, <laughs> gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Remember that? This is the, when the Messiah comes, this is how your king will come. In, in peace and in humility, both. Not warring, not riding in and strength and, and power and, and running over everybody else, but coming in, in peace and in humility. Talking about Jesus. And then it says he's going to proclaim peace to the nations. And uh, and then because of the blood of my covenant with you, I'll free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Um, I want to start going a little deeper right now. This is one of two times in the Old Testament that it talks about the blood of the covenant. Yet, it was these words that Jesus used at the Last Supper. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So we hear that every, every month when we, when we celebrate communion together, don't we? And so we take that as a, 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 a common phrase. And yet, this only the second time in the whole Old Testament that it's even mentioned. But again, it's tied in with Jesus. And so we see that, that, that Christ entering into our world as the king with peace and humility, bringing salvation, treats us uh, in a particular way because of this covenant, this promise uh, of his blood. And so... Um, uh, I want to talk about what it means for us to be um, uh, prisoners in um, the waterless pit. I know you're going, why would you pick that phrase? Um, well, first of all, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to more of you than just the moms, but I think this really works for the moms. Um, <laughs> being trapped in a waterless pit. That's kind of, you know, being a mom in this day and age. <laughs> And uh, what they, the, the the situation was in in the uh, in those times, uh, they didn't have big jails like we have, big elaborate prison systems and uh, uh, places to store people up. So what they often did was they would take a uh, a cistern that had gone dry and um, throw the people down in that. That became their prison. Can't get out. Walls are high, 
And, um, and I thought, you know, this is the way my mind works, okay? Here's the, the, the weird Westfall way of looking at things. I thought of that and I thought, you know, the, the most common thing in their lives, the, the way to store their supply of water for their homes. Every home, every neighborhood had a cistern. And, um, and that's the place that people found themselves imprisoned. That's where they were trapped, in the most common, everyday sort of place. Um, and they, they're trapped and they can't get out. And they have no say in their life. And uh, um, there's, a, there's a passage in, in the Old Testament about another prophet, Jeremiah, who was thrown into one of these and talks about this dry cistern. But what they, what they did was they, the cistern wasn't filled with water, but it was filled with mud at the bottom. So he's like neck deep in mud at the bottom of this well, basically. Can't get out of it, and there's no supply of water, so you never wash it off, and you're just submerged in the mud. And I thought, that's what it is to be a mother. <laughs> you're just, you know, I thought about mom, <laughs> you know, with us four kids and, and uh, uh, all the things that happen. And, and here it is, you're down in there, and it's, and it's dirty, and it's not where you want to be, and you don't have a lot of control, and, and you can't really get yourself out. You need to be pulled out of that. And I think spiritually we've got a lot of uh, uh, dry holes in our life, waterless pits that we can find ourselves in. And you may be in one right now. And you, and you feel like this was just an everyday thing, but now it's become more than that in me. And now I'm trapped in it. Um, I think this is how addictions happen with us. It just was a, a regular thing, and then it became more than regular, and then it became something that imprisoned us. This is how things go sideways in our relationships. They think, well, this is just a, a relationship. This is just an everyday thing, and then pretty soon it becomes imprisoning to us, and it's choking the life out of us, or it's just pulling us down in the muck. And uh, I think that today, probably every one of us could identify the waterless pit that we've either been in that we need to be rescued out of or that we're afraid we're about to descend into and um, or that we've been in so long we go it's just it's just my life which is maybe the saddest of all it's just my life this is what it is it'll never change there's no hope that feeling of being trapped cut off and powerless is probably one of the worst feelings we can have uh, in, in all of our lives. And there's a loneliness that covers over that. And, um, and so, it's all the more powerful when he says, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope. What a great phrase. Oh my goodness, prisoners of hope. You're not really imprisoned in the everyday muck. You're actually held captive by a tangible hope. And, and the hope is that God is going to come through and will not leave you. Like Jesus said, I will never leave you or I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end. I will be with you. And so we're, we're held by this, this hope. And uh, hope is a really strange thing because, uh, you know, for me, I'm a really negative person. You know, I, I kind of bask in that. Um, I, I have a kind of a giftedness for negativity. And, um, and so I had to realize that hope is not uh, just wishful thinking. It's not just uh, can things be better, maybe, you know, when you wish upon a star, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, that was Jiminy Cricket I was quoting there. Um, it's not that. It's actually a very, and, and for Christians, it's a very tangible thing. It's a very concrete thing. It's, it's uh, the realization and, and claiming the victory and the freedom and the release that, that comes to us from the Lord. 
So as this king comes in, as the Messiah comes in, as Jesus comes into our life, then we become free uh, from, from our prisons and, and our hope is the thing that's held us and, and it's what keeps us and defines us. Now, in uh, Romans, This is a passage you know really well. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. I hate that part of the verse, by the way. I really love the we, we, uh, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts. Um, that's the real cycle, isn't it? And we've talked about this before. That uh, even in the hardest thing, which um, i got to tell you, as a, as a church family, I think this is the biggest collection of difficulties that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I've been in churches with thousands of people, and, and, and nobody has shared as much hard stuff as you people have. <laughs> Now, I've been told by some of you that actually there were just as many people with hurts there. They just never shared. Everybody just looked good, you know. You come to church, everything looks good. It all looks fine, mighty fine. Everything's great. Just praise the Lord. Here, we all come in and go, how's it going? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, it's like, whoa. <laughs> Where do you get that from, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start greeting you at the door like my old friend did, you know. Uh, how's it going? Tell me only the good stuff, only the happy things. <laughs> but no, no, no. I mean, I'm really, I'm really proud. I mean, I love you guys for it because we, we have the ability to love each other because we don't have to pretend everything's so super, right? And that gives us a freedom to discover a real, concrete, tangible hope in the middle of our stuff. I'm not defining what your stuff is because it's diverse. But... Um, <laughs> Suffering produces perseverance. One of the great insights in this is from uh, Lou Smeads, who I, I love, um, in his book, How Can It Be All Right When Everything Is All Wrong? Good title for a book. You and I were created for joy, and if we miss it, we miss the reason for our existence. If our joy is honest joy, it must somehow be congruous with human tragedy. This is the test of joy's integrity. Is it compatible with pain? Only the heart that hurts has a right to joy. Hear that? Only the, the heart that hurts has a right to joy. And so uh, when, when um, Paul writes this in Romans, we rejoice. There's joy in the hope of the glory of God, but we also have joy in our sufferings because that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint. We actually are the very prisoners of hope that are described in this Old Testament prophet's prophecy. Our lives have shown us that our joy is connected to our struggle. Our struggle is connected to the, the marks of our character, right? Every every scar that we have, every you know, nobody gets to be my age without limping. You know, every limp that we have, every deal that comes up, it's like that becomes part of our character, who we are, right? So when you share real and honest and your real life with each other, and you pray for each other, and you encourage each other, and and the sharing is mutual, that our character is being built. We're being, we're being constructed. Like your brother's house. Better than your uncle's helping him than me. Trust me, I don't build things. But, but I think about that and I go, you know, part by part, God is building us through hardships, perseverance, character. Now, and in that we have hope because hope does not disappoint I, I'm thinking for my own life that it seems like we go an awful long time waiting for God to 
break in with some good news. Does it seem that way? It's not, uh, anybody here overwhelmed with good news? You know, it's, it's, you know, I wish I had more time for pain, you know, because I'm just, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> made me feel like I'm, you know. Most of us spend a lifetime waiting for God to break in, to come riding into our lives, saying, it's over with the battles. The war is over. Break up the bows. Get rid of the chariots. It's time for some peace. Anybody want that? I, I know I do. I'm ready for it. And... Um, And I think it's interesting that in this passage with the Old Testament prophet, Zechariah, you know, we think of this passage of the king coming in on Jesus on the donkey, remember that, you know, coming in, Palm Sunday, kids are waving, big parade, hoopla, you know, the whole deal. What about the people sitting in the dry cisterns? They're not part of the parade. They're missing it. And so I think it's really telling that when the king comes and everybody's cheering, it's a big celebration that it says, I'll bring you up out of that. I'll go to, the, I'll go to you where, where you are. So usually we, have to, we feel like we have to get somewhere else before uh, it's okay for God to work with us. As soon as, you know, have you ever asked somebody to go to church with you and they go, well, I'm going through some stuff right now, you know, this is what happened. I go, hey, come visit our church. Oh, you know, pastor, I've got a lot of problems. And, and as soon as I work these all out, then I'm going to come visit your church. I go, you don't need to visit the church once you work them all out. You wouldn't fit in anyway. Go to the big shallow church then, you know, but... I mean, what is that? That we have to fix ourselves up. We have to get everything together. We have to solve all our problems. We have to have everything wonderful. Now we're ready for the Lord. That is so screwed up. Oh my gosh. How do we get so messed up in that? The Lord comes to us while we're imprisoned in the dry cisterns. The waterless pit. That's when the Lord comes to us. So let me bring you up out of there. Let me take care of you, you prisoner of hope. Don't climb out yourself and come and meet me. I'll come to you. And, the, and if we could really understand that Jesus comes to us when we're in the pit, that would change everything. That would be transformative, wouldn't it? We don't have to get it together before the Lord works. You know, in 1 Peter it says, be prepared, be ready to give an answer when someone asks you for the reason for your hope. Remember that verse? Remember that? Be ready to give an answer when somebody asks you, why do you have hope? What's the reason for that? And I have to confess that I'm probably not ready to give an answer to that question. So I started thinking this week, well, if I'm not ready to give an answer for it, then I bet some of them aren't either. <laughs> and I'm not saying who, I'm not making eye contact, you know. You know who you are. And, and, and I think we need to do something this week to, to prepare ourselves to give an answer for why we have hope. But what do we hope? You know, we, we prisoners of hope here, for whom God comes and brings us out and says, I'm going to, I'm going to pay you back double. I'm going to make up the losses in your life. I'm going to provide for you. What's the reason? So, I was thinking about Dale, for her kingdom assignment, had made a, a plethora of cards. Remember that? What's a plethora? That's a, three amigos. Sorry. Well, um, what's a plethora? So she would made a plethora of cards for us to write and send to people, send notes to people, right? Well, I don't want you to do that with these. I took all of the cards that say hope on them, okay? Of which there are many and they're different and, you know, oops, I slipped a few courages in here. Well, pretend that says hope. Okay, so um, 
I want you, if you're willing to take this assignment, I'm going to put these back on the back table. And I want you to take one. And I don't want you to send it to somebody, okay? I'm not putting envelopes with these. I want you to use this card to write down some of the reasons for your hope in your life. And you may sit there and go, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do this exercise. And you're sitting there with your pen and you're going, maybe I should get a pencil because at least I could erase and start over. <laughs> uh, and so, and you may be going, okay, the first thing you're thinking is, I, okay, the first thing I'm writing is, if John's really stupid, why is he making me do this? Okay, write that down, that's okay. But I want you to then begin to ask, Lord, Lord, what is the reason for my hope? Show me. Show me what's made me a prisoner of hope. What is it that I can hold on to? What is it that I do hold on to? How have you met me? Show me where you've come to me in the pit. And where I've seen you work in life. And that's so now I can believe that you'll work again. Or, Lord, here's where I need to see you work in order that I can believe that you'll work again. You know, some things are still unresolved. I need you to work here. Then, so, but anyway, whatever it is for you, I want you to write that down. Okay? I want you to keep that. As part of your preparation for when somebody asks you, what is the reason for your hope? I'm going to forever begin that answer for me by saying, well, first of all, you need to know that I'm a prisoner of hope. And I claim that as a, as a badge of honor. I'm not held captive by the circumstances. I'm not held captive by what other people have done. This is new for me. Um, <laughs> I'm not held captive by my failures, my, uh, my ways I've embarrassed myself. I'm not held captive by my limitations even. I'm held captive by the reality of God's presence in my life and his fulfilling his promise to bring me out of the pit. Okay, I'll put these on the back. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love and care. Thank you that you don't leave us in the pits. Thank you that you do give us hope in the reality of our stuff. And, and Lord, we pray that you would bless us today and bless the moms today and uh, give us the courage to treat people with compassion and let our hope show through. That's it. That's our prayer. Amen.